we are now going to learn about Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born February 12, 1809 in Shrewsbury, and that date may sound familiar. That's the same exact date that Abraham Lincoln was born. And he grew up, but when he was young, his mother died, and so he was primarily raised by his sisters. Now his father, the son of Erasmus Darwin, his name is Robert Darwin, he also um, was a physician and a well-respected physician. And so Darwin comes from a family that is fairly wealthy and prominent in the society. When Darwin gets close to the time to go to college, he is um, going to go and study medicine, just like his grandfather, his father, even his older brother. And so he goes to Edinburgh University. And he enters to study medicine at the age of 16. I like this quote from Darwin. He says, the instruction at Edinburgh was altogether by lectures and those were intolerably dull, with the exception of those on chemistry. To my mind, there are no advantages and many disadvantages in lectures compared with reading. Dr. So-and-so made his lectures on human anatomy as dull as he was himself and the subject disgusted me. I always wonder how many students feel the same um, during biology lectures. Nevertheless, Darwin is studying and he's a mediocre student. He's not doing great. And then in his second year, they get into the medicine of amputation. Back then there were no you know, antibiotics or anything like that, and so that was a common practice and something very important that a doctor needed to know how to do. And these types of lessons were just too much blood and too much gore for Darwin, and basically he quits and goes back home a failed medical student. His dad says you cannot just live off the family's money, even though there was enough money to go around, but they, you know, you've got to do something. And so he enters Christ College, Cambridge. Um, and so Darwin actually begins studying to become an Anglican minister. That someone has written about this time period that perhaps the church was at the same time the refuge of the talented and brilliant, did not in any way hinder it from performing the humble but useful service of relieving despairing fathers of surplus sons. Some Dar Darwin um, biographers have noted that perhaps the relationship between Darwin's father and himself were not, was not great during this time. Nevertheless, Charles continues to study. Once again, though, he is a mediocre student. He still is, um, at the time he begins studying, a fairly devout believer. He grew up in a family where it was okay to question things. His father definitely was a thinker and a, and a questioner, so was his grandfather. So it's not that he couldn't question, but you know, you would probably classify him as a believer. Darwin's real passion though, and he starts to really develop this while at Christ College, Cambridge, is natural history. And luckily there is a professor at there, John Henslow, who's the professor of botany, and he notices that Darwin has this fantastic mind and ability for natural history. In fact, Darwin becomes known as the man who walks with Henslow because they would go on walks around the countryside. And he's the one that introduced Darwin to geology. So eventually, Darwin learns and learns and learns and graduates, actually, with a degree in theology. And then he kind of just starts spending time out hunting with buddies and and not really doing much. He never actually did the last steps to become a minister. And, and then an opportunity for a voyage that was going to go around the world and, and particularly around the coastlines of South America to map certain areas of South America. And, uh, and John Henslow hears about this and tries to get Darwin to go on the Beagle. His father's not enthused about this and an uncle, Josiah Wedgwood, steps in and also helps and together they basically convince Darwin's father to let him go and so Henslow gets Darwin on the Beagle. Before Darwin leaves on the Beagle, this book is published by Charles Lyell and Principles of Geology is essential for Darwin's development of his ideas, especially how the earth is very old and how slow processes can create large changes, not just in geology but also in organisms. So the voyage starts in, in London and goes all the way down to South America, around the coastline, up to the Galapagos and around the world and back, and then eventually back to, to London. It ends up being about a five-year journey. In South America, Darwin notes that it's a wonderful land of chaos. He also realizes for the first time how cruel um, slavery can be in other parts of the world. And He and the captain, who was a pro-slavery, 
um, individual have their first fight. So Captain Fitzroy and Darwin fight first over slavery and then later over more um, uh, issues like evolution and, and so forth. Um, while in South America, Darwin discovers some amazing mammalian fossils. He also is present in Chile when an earthquake happens. And he goes out to the coast the next day and actually sees the coastline uplifted, you know, eight feet from where it was the day before. And all of these things come together and help Darwin realize that like the Andes Mountains were made by little earthquakes over lots of periods of time. And that's why you find fossils up in the top of the Andes Mountains. Eventually they make their way to Galapagos where a lot of people know that Darwin was at and where he studied um, many of the organisms here. Now, the Galapagos are volcanic in origin, so when they're first made, nothing's there. But there were some peculiar combinations here that, of organisms that were extraordinarily tame. You know, there were like nocturnal gulls, like this, the only place in the world where these types of birds forage at night. Flightless cormorants, nowhere else in the world do you have cormorants that have lost the ability to fly. Marine iguanas, nowhere else in the world do iguanas dive into the ocean and eat algae off of rocks. And then, of course, the namesake of the island, the giant tortoises. And Darwin saw that there was variation from island to island for all of these different species. So he comes back from his trip, and he's thinking about this, and he's mulling this over, but he still doesn't have his idea of natural selection nailed down. It takes a couple years, maybe, after he gets back from the voyage. And one night, or one day, he, he brings into his thinking ideas from Robert Malth Thomas Robert Malthus. And as particularly, the, there's an essay called Principles of Population, and in this it, it talks about how the growth of a population is always going to exceed the growth in the available food supply. He also advocated some things that were kind of terrible, but, but he basically said that populations increase faster than resources can. So you end up with this conundrum where there are not enough resources to cover all of the individuals in the population, so some are going to die, which means there's a struggle to survive. And this was an important aspect of Darwin's natural selection. So after he uh, gets the idea for, for natural selection and before he publishes it, he starts to do different things in his life, like he actually gets married in 1839 to Emma Wedgwood. You may remember that last name from a previous slide. That, this is his cousin. He moves to Downhouse Kent after they've had a couple children. They end up having ten children in total, total three of which die in early causes. Uh, in fact, Darwin's daughter Annie, or Anna, was the um, oldest daughter and probably one of the favorites of Darwin and really affected him. In fact, a lot of people um, mention that this might be the moment that you can say for sure Darwin becomes agnostic all the way. He was leading into this um, even after he graduated from um, his theology degree, but by this time for sure he is an agnostic. And he continues to publish on different scientific topics throughout the years. And he begins this large book called Natural Selection but never gets finished. That eventually becomes summarized into what is Origin of Species. But he's waiting, waiting, waiting. Until a man named Alfred Russell Wallace, who was also a biologist who was traveling around the world, especially in South America and in Malaysia, sends a letter to Darwin that basically has the exact same ideas of natural selection. Darwin receives this letter and is appalled because he's like, oh no, someone else has this idea. He didn't, Darwin didn't want to act like he had stolen this idea, but his friends convince him and, and basically they present Wallace's letter and then a letter that, or a publication that Darwin puts together um, at the um, Linnaean Society meeting in London on July 1st, 1858. And then Darwin frantically goes and his friends say, you've got to put a book together, and so he does. And we have the On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And that's the full title there, but usually we just call this Origin of Species. It was published November 24th, 1859, when Darwin was 50 years old. All the copies sold out the first day, and it went through six editions until 1882, the year that Darwin died. And a lot of times people are always, you know, accusing Darwin of discussing human evolution. Well, he did, but he didn't in this book. In this book, the only sentence that even talks about it is this. It says, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. But nevertheless, the outroar began. And so Darwin needed some allies, and the ally that stepped up was Thomas Henry Huxley. He's known as Darwin's bulldog, and he's the one that really advanced the acceptance of this theory more than anyone at that time.
He says, I read your book yesterday, and as for everything, I'm ready to go to the stake if requisite. I love at the end, he says, you should remember that some of your friends, referring to himself, are endowed with an amount of combativeness, may stand you in good need. I am sharpening up my claws and beak in readiness. And he's the one that went and fought, fought for this. He, he challenged all of the leading religious figures like Wilberforce and others. In the final years of Darwin, he continues to publish on things like orchids and plants. He does put together a book called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And this is where he really talks about human evolution and proposes that humans evolved out of Africa. He talks about climbing plants and, and he even does some of the origin, some of the first work on biographical sketches of an infant. In other words, developmental biology in, in infants. You know, he would watch his own children and he would even watch, uh, go to the zoo and watch some of the other primates. He looked at the power and movements of plants and he was finishing up his work on worms. In fact, he told his wife, when I die, just bury me in the garden with my worms. Darwin did die on uh, the 19th of April, 1882, and he is buried in this building, which is Westminster Abbey. Uh, originally, he was just going to have kind of a normal funeral out in the countryside, but his friends convinced the London, uh, the, or the England, to give him a state's funeral, which is the highest honor you can get. And he's married, you know, not a stone's throw from people like Sir Isaac Newton and, and Halliday and so forth. And that brings us to the end of Charles Darwin. What a wonderful man and, and, uh, and really a, um, an important figure in evolution. And thus, that's why one of the reasons he gets the title of the father of evolution. But there were lots of others that were involved in this development of this idea. And we'll, t we'll continue to learn more about that throughout the rest of the course. Mm -hmm.